Well, hi, everybody. This is Kevin Maurer out in Utah, and I'm here with the main event. Dr. Hanink is with us, and he is uh, running for governor of California. He'll be delivering our, our keynote. Uh, Dr. James G. Hanink is the American Solidarity Party's candidate in the 2021 California gubernatorial recall election. Dr. Hanink received his PhD from Michigan State University. Uh, he's formerly professor of philosophy at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Currently, he serves as president of the American Maritime Association. And Hanink has long been an editor and writer for the New Oxford Review. He also hosts the Open Door podcast with his wife, Elizabeth. He lives in Inglewood, California. They have six children and five grandchildren. Dr. Hanink, it's uh, really an honor uh, to have you here at this convention and uh, really looking forward to your remarks. Thank you, Kevin. It's a privilege to join you and all the solidarity people this evening. Where to begin? As it happens, I find myself thinking of a familiar angelic admonition. It's true, isn't it, that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. But here I am rushing into a California special recall election. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger spent some time gearing up for his run against then-Governor Gray Davis. It's early days yet, but so far, at least in my hearing, no one has called me a fool for trying to unseat Gavin Newsom. Why, even from the start, my wife Elizabeth has been mildly encouraging. She tells me that the campaign will add some color to my obituary. So what can I report of the campaign in California? Whether online or in interviews and debates, I highlight three California issues. The first issue though, it's not just ours, is housing and homelessness. Here are a few background statistics. Our median housing costs are the highest in the nation. California ranks 49th in the nation in housing units per resident. In Los Angeles, more than half of us are renters and almost half of the renters spend at least half of their income on housing. The statistics are dismal. How can we change them? I argue for economic democracy of broad ownership, including home ownership. Housing is a human good, and where there are resources to provide housing, there is a right to it. California has the resources to realize this good, but it lacks the political will to do so. The crisis is a tragedy of our own making. State support and funding and tax credits will be critical in our response to a now chronic housing emergency. I back legislation that allows owners of single family homes to build additional homes on their property. Good statewide policies depend on local participation. The new strong towns movement helps us to think through the interchange between families and communities. It calls for many owners and many builders. The principle of subsidiarity gives us our direction. Even in the political sphere, subsidiarity begins with the family. It is the first social unit. Seen in this light, we'll only resolve the housing crisis if we have healthy families. 
It is they who can make houses into living homes. Then come neighborhoods. Then come all the rest. Living homes are welcoming. They counter the isolation of our mega cities. But when our own housing is precarious, it becomes daunting to open our homes to others. Our party platform understands this. It affirms that, quote, funding and services should also be provided to encourage families to care for elderly and disabled family members at home without being impoverished by lost income. This should include preferential housing options, tax credits, and respite care. Another pair of statistics understands our poverty and the growing encampments of the homeless. More than a third of Californians are living in or near poverty. There are about 125,000 homeless in this golden state of ours. Homelessness is another tragedy of our own making. There's no easy fix now, but one approach that surely fails is the not in my backyard, NIMBY mindset. The homeless are already down the street and around the corner. They, they sleep on our beaches and in our parks. For a start, I ask that we take the time to talk with homeless people in our own neighborhoods. And let's redouble our efforts to educate ourselves about the mental illness and drug addiction that crushes the homelessness. The, the second California issue, undocumented immigration, is not unique to our state but it plays a pivotal role in our politics. How do I address it? First, I put forward a framework. If this land is our land, it is because we are its stewards. We do not own California, as Jeff Bezos claims he owns Amazon. Our stewardship of the land must serve the common good. The common good embraces those who face hunger. It embraces those who face political and religious persecution in their countries of origin. We need policies that reconcile secure borders with a commitment to human dignity. Identifying the root causes of immigration will often lead us to reflect on how our country has used its economic power abroad. This framework of stewardship leads to five particulars. Following our party's platform, I advocate that immigration enforcement should focus on the illegal hiring practices of large corporations that immigration courts need realistic funding, that we have a duty to provide humane facilities for refugee influxes. We must target the trafficking of humans and narcotics. We should accommodate immigrants without a criminal record who seek permanent residency. Security and generosity are not at odds. The final issue my campaign highlights is the struggle for a consistent ethics of life. Again, it is hardly unique to California, but our inconsistency is especially grievous. A consistent ethics of life is paramount because the intrinsic dignity of the human being is paramount. 
The creator fashions every one of us in his own image and likeness. There are four key points that I put forward to challenge California and consistency. First, let's close the book on capital punishment. The manifest fallibility of the criminal justice system requires it. But more than a flawed procedure is that issue. Even the worst criminal remains a human being and as such has an inherent dignity. The next step is for the University of California to cut its ties with the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. In the laboratory's own language, its mission is advancing nuclear weapons, science and technology and minding the existing stockpiles of nuclear weapons. What does this amount to if not the care and feeding of mutual assured destruction? It's in the service of state-sponsored nuclear terrorism. Call it what it is. Now comes the physician-assisted suicide of those who face grave health problems. In 2015, California approved the End of Life Option Act. This legislation ignores obvious objections. Physicians make mistakes with respect to prognosis. It's difficult to distinguish between severe depression and a fixed will to end one's life. In contrast, it's easy for vulnerable people to be pressured into suicide. Compassion isn't killing. What we need is better education and pain control and respectful hospice care for the terminally ill. Last is the entrenched practice of abortion. In the latest twist, the University of California now provides on-campus access to medical abortion. My state also refuses to report its abortion statistics to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But no one can deny that since Roe versus Wade, there have been well over 60 million legal abortions in the United States. This ghastly statistic marks a colossal failure. It is always wrong to deliberately kill an innocent human being. But abortion, is the deliberate dismembering of an innocent preborn baby. It's long past time to reject what we now expedite. There's a wide range of pressures, economic, social, and psychological, that lead many to accept abortion. Crisis pregnancy centers struggle to address them. To their shame, our former Attorney General, Javier Becerra, and our former Senator, Kamala Harris, did their best to shut down crisis pregnancy centers. The Biden administration, which they have joined, wants to normalize the massacre of the innocents. Please allow me now to make a transition. At this point, you might be thinking enough about California, yet I, I would not be speaking to you were I not in our recall election, nor would I be campaigning had I not learned from my fellow Californians. I have especially in mind three people, 
each has been a national leader. The first is Skylar Kovic. He tutors me on what it means to have a party like ours and what we must do to keep its heart beating. The second is Desmond Silvera. His campaign for governor in 2018 showed us that the thing could be done and done well. Today, he's my campaign manager and it means lots of managing. The third is Brian Carroll, our recent presidential candidate. In the worst of times, he lucidly introduced the platform of this party to the broadest audience we've had. And it goes without saying, doesn't it, that he and I appreciate how important a youth ticket is, at least in cardiovascular terms. All of us, young and not so young, are looking at dozens of national issues. The best I can do tonight is to urge a close reading of the fine essays coming from the American Commons. Here are some top recommendations. Ryan Ellington on what's wrong with journalism. Shane Hoffman on how the government sometimes makes childhood hunger worse. Ruth Powers on the common core a failing experiment in centralized education. Josh Williams on how to reclaim the language of solidarity. And Eric Anton on, on what reparations would look like. More of these essays are on the way. And engaging a, a good essay, uh, as, as worthy as it is, isn't enough. So I would like to make a foray into recent contributions in the scholarship ready for our, our study. I could say that this foray will conclude my remarks, but that's false because we are in fact going to conclude interactively, if not Socratically. I turn then to a collection of insights from Alistair McIntyre. He is perhaps the greatest living Thomist. And in part, this is due to having overcome his Marxist past. His most recent book is Ethics in the Conflicts of Modernity. Marxism in practice meant a centralization of power in order to achieve a worker's paradise that never came. Marxists failed, Marxists failed to, to achieve what McIntyre notes they needed most. Quote, genuinely local political initiatives through which the possibilities of a grassroots distribution of powers and property could be achieved. In contrast, he points out, again quoting him, distributists affirm that because there is a human interest and not just a class interest in remaking the social and economic order, needed changes can come from several quarters. But McIntyre is no capitalist. Capitalism, fueled as it is by a a voracious acquisitiveness, commodifies us all. And doing so, it undercuts right reason. And practice capitalist expansionism aims, as McIntyre writes, to shape and elicit desire for objects that rational agents directed to the ends of human flourishing have no good reason to desire. The result is the established disorder of just another form of economism. Distributists have contested this disorder. disorder. Also, McIntyre tells us they do so by, I'm quoting him, 
making and sustaining institutions that provide for those practices through which common goods are achieved. And what are they? They are the associations that we best love. They include, he says, families, workplaces, schools, clinics, theaters, and they, for the most part, take the form of cooperative enterprises. But what are the prospects of distributism? What can we say about the success or failure of these associations and the growing bands of friends who nurture them? McIntyre's answer, I think, is in keeping with our own experiences. He says, what such enterprises characteristically encounter is tension and conflict with the institutions of the dominant culture, since they put in question the morals and politics of that culture. To this he adds, quote, how successful they can be in doing this is not yet decided. Indeed it's not, but our party, our party can improve the odds. That is, we can do so if we act. Plus, guess what? Metaphysics is on our side. There's a remarkable axiom at issue. Everything, everything seeks to realize itself in act, to perfect itself in act. Jacques Maritain, a founder of the Christian democracy movement, would add that existence is the fundamental form of action and our flourishing is its full expression. Like Maritain, Vaclav Havel, the Czech author and statesman, was a champion of human rights. In his later years, he wrote, quote, I am convinced that the deepest roots of what we now call human rights lie somewhere deeper than the world of human covenants in a realm that I would describe as metaphysical, that is to say, in the very structure of the real. The metaphysics of the person leads us to both our inner freedom and to its public expression. As persons, we have a freedom that differs radically from a mere set of behaviors. And because we are free, we have personal responsibility. Dorothy Day, a friend of Jacques Maritain, could be dismissive of what she called Holy Mother of the State. No state, however powerful as a person. Rather, a state is what we make of it. No political party, however promising, is a person. This party of ours is what we make of it. Building it up is a personal responsibility. Now, for my last transition and Scout's honor, closing remarks. Philosophy has its start in common sense. And who better to speak for common sense than my dad's favorite comic, Will Rogers. Were he here tonight, he might well say to us, as he said to the reformers of the 1930s, even if you are on the right track, you get run over if you just sit there. That's a cue for me to ask for your help here and now. In California, we have something called the Voter's Guide. Therein, candidates tell the public who they are and why they are running. The cost of telling about yourself and your goals is $25 per word. There's also a candidate filing fee in the neighborhood of $4,000.
Plus, we'd like to have at least one we advert. Maybe something about a mouse that's roaring. If you can help, visit our website, CA period solidarity hyphen party period org. But the American Solidarity Party is also working on its future. One way is with the Chesterton Kuiper Fellowship Program. To strengthen the voice of Christian democracy, we need to invest in the young leaders of our movement. This new fellowship mentors promising practitioners of Christian democracy. No doubt we'll find future candidates among them. Meanwhile, the program costs about $220 per fellow per week. There's of course something more precious than money. It's time. Join us please in taking the time to build up active local chapters of the party. There's plenty of work and more for everyone at this convention. I began this evening with an admonition about angels. I will end with another, this time from G.K. Chesterton, a distributist of renown. If in our foolishness we rush in where angels fear to tread, we had best remember that angels can fly because they take themselves so lightly. Thank you. Siempre adelante con juicio. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Henning. Uh, really enjoyed those remarks, uh, highly edifying, and we're so proud uh, to have you representing our party in such a high profile election. I, I just want to give another plug uh, for, for donating to the campaign. Um, it, we were trying to uh, get Folks like Dr. Hanink, uh, not just on this ballot, but on ballots across the country. Um, and so if you wanna help this campaign, help the Solidarity Party grow in California while bringing attention to issues like housing, immigration, and, and life issues, as he mentioned, uh, please donate to this campaign. Um, and we'd especially encourage you to find some room in your budget for a monthly donation. And I'll, I'll post uh, another link here in the chat as well. Um, so Dr. Hanek, I just have a, a couple questions for you before we open it up uh, to everybody. It is, it is novel, admittedly, uh, for a professional philosopher to uh, run for public office. Uh, there's the old platonic ideal of, of the uh, philosopher king. Uh, Plato said uh, that there ought to be a conjunction of political power and philosophic intelligence. Uh, so I, I know you may not be somebody to toot your own horn too much, but um, how would you say that, uh, that California would benefit from having a philosopher as governor? Kevin, it all depends on the philosopher. Uh, if things are bad now, they'd be worse if Thomas Hobbes were in charge. <laughs> they'd be worse if Karl Marx were in charge. They'd be way worse if Ayn Rand were in charge. And they'd be absolutely abysmal if Michel Foucault were in charge. So philosophy, broadly conceived, is hard thinking about hard subjects. And I think so long as we has a, uh, have a governor who's willing to, to think hard about hard subjects, we'll do better than we are now. Okay, excellent. Yeah, fair, fair point. It definitely dep depends on the, the philosophy that the person is, is uh, abiding by. Um, I, I'm wondering also, just looking back in American history, is there a state governor in US history that you would be seeking to emulate in this campaign? Yes, Robert La Follette. He was the governor in Wisconsin, the 19 teens, died in 1925. He started out as a, a Republican. He tried to gain some sort of support from Democrats 
and he went on to form a third party. What a good idea. What a good idea. Uh, he was called by friend and foe like Fighting Bob. What a good attitude. You know, I am a Wisconsin a Wisconsinite by birth. And uh, when I decided to ask you that question, I, I kind of asked myself, how would I answer that, you know, without doing too much digging? And Bob LaFollette is the first person that came to my mind. So I appreciate that answer. Uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, we love him. Uh, he's got high schools named after him. And uh, to this day, I think his grandson is the Secretary of State of Wisconsin. So big name there. So I appreciate that, that answer. We have a question from Alan. Um, he asks, aside from donating, how can those of us in California get involved with the campaign? Uh, maybe something you'd want to direct to your, uh, to your campaign manager, Desmond, or if, if you've got an answer uh, now. I think something coming up soon, we just don't know when because they won't tell us. We'll have uh, forms to get signatures on and if you walk around your block with a form in hand they usually are good for 15 signatures if you did that it'd be great it'd be great excellent excellent yeah um how many signatures do you need in california well i think and everything is in flux i think we need about 700 700,000? No. Oh, that would, only that would, only... that would be a tsunami. That would be a <laughs> fox. Just 700 signatures. 700 signatures. Oh, well, Alan, you could probably get all those on your own, actually. Just go to the farmer's market and spend a day. Well, that's fantastic. I, 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 that, that sounds like a great thing to get uh, people involved in right off the bat. And sounds very doable. That's great. Great. Uh, well, Alan, um, if you want to send us your your email address, uh, we could we could talk talk offline uh, and get you connected with with this campaign. Or uh, Dr. Hanink, is there an e a good email for Desmond that we could just send to Alan as well? Or you could just uh, send something to Dr. James Hanink for governor. Okay, I will put that in the chat as well. Uh, and that's um, at, at gmail.com. Oh, that's the website. Oh, okay. So there's a, there's like a form he can fill out at the website. Yeah. Okay. Or just, just leave a message there. Okay. Okay. Dr. James Hanning for governor.com. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Got that email as well. We will, we will follow up with you. Great. Well, we're taking more questions, uh, so feel free to to write uh, whatever question you have with Dr. Hanick. Um, otherwise, I'll I'll go forward with a couple more questions for the conversation. Um, so you have experience in in academia, obviously, in in California, and you know California's public and private universities are among the most prestigious in the world. And so how does your professional experience in academia shape your approach to higher education policy within California? This is a little bit of a pushback, Kevin, on the wording of the question. Sure. I know what you're saying when you use the word prestigious. Everybody in the academy knows what you mean, what that word means. But... How important is it to be prestigious? And, and what is it to be prestigious? Uh, somebody said, is the American Solidarity Party the most prestigious party in the United States to say? <laughs> I'd say, no, but it's the best. <laughs> it's the best. And when I think about what it is to be prestigious, I think about well, what really matters, what really matters. And here are some thoughts I have about uh, higher education policy uh, within the state of California. First of all, uh, 
I don't think of the state as the master teacher. I don't think that the criteria likely to be issued by the state are the best criteria. I think that the idea of the state as the master teacher is an illusion and a dangerous one if we think of the figures that are leading the state. Now, more particularly, I'd want to emphasize liberal arts. And I'd want to emphasize community colleges. And I'd want to, well, uh, take a long, hard look at uh, extramural athletics in the context of prestigious universities. I think uh, the big time schools present us with a kind of athletic front that heightens or deepens our celebrity culture and takes us away from truly amateur athletics. I'd like to see a real emphasis on intramural athletics. I think that would make a big difference. Mm. Yeah, follow-up question on that. Uh, so the Supreme Court recently decided, I mean, they're chipping away uh, slowly, it seems, at the current NCAA uh, framework of amateurism. Um, would you oppose California public schools uh, going down a direction of, of paying their student athletes? Well, everything in context, uh... If they're going to exploit them, they ought to exploit them less grievously, but they ought not to exploit them in the first place. There ought not to be this bizarre kind of secular liturgy <laughs> of Saturday afternoon <laughs> football, basketball, baseball. And of course, all of that has spin-off consequences. We now have as how could this possibly be? The NFL as a moral arbiter? <laughs> Take care of your own concussions first. Yeah, thank you for that. We got a, a message from um, Dr. Rhonda Shervin. I ah, hope I pronounced your name she correctly. She hired me. Yeah, she's, she That's says where I was. That's where the system went wrong. She hired me. <laughs> She says, I was the chair of the Department of Philosophy who hired Dr. Hanning, and I want to greet and mention some of his wonderful acts. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Chervin, for that. Um, if you want to mention, mention any... the acts. <laughs> if, if you would like to, you can, you can write them there in the, in the chat uh, around it as well, or Dr. Chervin. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, we got a message from Richard Kyle Spicer, uh, who says... A simple thank you. Uh, keep those comments coming and, and questions. And in the meantime, I've, I've got a couple more questions for Dr. Hanink. Um, so uh, California has been a world leader for setting emission standards for decades, even before the Federal Clean Air Act. Um, so they actually they were sort of of course grandfathered in so they can set their own emission standards that are more strict. Um, so some, in some ways, they have among the strictest in the world. Uh, in your view, Dr. Hanning, what should be California's next concrete steps toward curbing the use of fossil fuels? Uh, limit, uh, even more than we have, offshore oil drilling. Um, limit, even more than we have, the practice of fracking. Uh, don't hesitate to increase the gas tax and consider taxing in a special calibrated way, vans, minivans and maxi vans. It used to be that uh, there would be a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage, but that car has turned out to be somewhere between a car and a truck. Well, I think uh, minivans are the car in California, and it's, yeah. it's r ridiculous. It's ridiculous. 
so uh, we should also, uh, if I didn't mention it already, not hesitate to keep the, da the gas tax going up. And, 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 and then of course, we need to have a conversion to mass transit. These are all difficult steps, but they're all necessary. Uh, the next time we have, and it could be a week from now, or it could be two weeks from now, uh, a, a major wildfire, or the next time we see uh, in front of the paper the, the latest reservoir to have two inches of water left in it, well, it doesn't happen by accident. Right. Thanks for that, Dr. Henning. Uh, we, we got another message from uh, Dr. Chervin. She said, besides being a terrific philosophy professor for many decades, he led us in peacefully protesting and counseling in front of abortion clinics in the area. So he, he walks the walk in addition to talking the talk. Uh, so thank you for that, Dr. Shervin. Um, and uh, Alan, following up on you, uh, we'll, we, we'll, we'll send you an email. Um, so um, he said that uh, just the, the link didn't work. Maybe I wrote it down incorrectly. Um, Dr. Dr. James Hanink for governor.com. Maybe it's .org. Is that, could that be? Yeah, it's just a website. Okay. Maybe, maybe you could try to Google it, Alan. Sorry about that, but we will, uh, we'll send you an email as well. We've sometimes been called uh, the campaigners. have sometimes been called the gang that can't shoot straight. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on improving. Well, we're, we're just starting out here. Uh, when is the election, by the way, Dr. Henning? Ah, now you'd think everybody would know that, but nobody knows it. <laughs> it's decided by the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State is an appointee of the governor. And uh, there's been a lot of speculation, and I think there's good reason to suppose that it will be in September. Okay. But we wouldn't be surprised if it were the month before, and some people think it would be the month after. Okay. But of course, unless you know when it's going to be, they're not going to give us the materials we need to gather signatures. So sooner or later, they're going to have to tell us. Right. Uh, so they've, they've got to set the signature deadline and give you enough time to, to actually do yes. it. Yeah. Yes. Well, excellent. Um, Okay, uh, Ed and Lindsay Frankovic have sent the website. Uh, uh -huh. are, you, are you able to see that, Alan? That's the treasurer. <laughs> he knows where the money isn't buried. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So plenty, of, plenty of time to get Dr. Hanink on the on the ballot and um, get this uh, campaign building momentum. Um, so again, please, uh, if you can, uh, donate uh, at that link that I have there in the chat. Uh, that'd be very helpful. Um, uh, let's ask a couple more questions. We have we have some time. Uh, so Dr. Hanning, uh, California is, of course, um, a very pro-choice state uh, when it comes to the abortion issue. Um, and there's only so much that a California governor could do uh, with the legislature as it is. Um, in your view, what are the most politically feasible while also being uh, morally just uh, ways that one could pursue limiting um, the incidence of abortion in California? Uh, elect pro-life people. Uh, in terms of uh, working out uh, the law, uh, the focus should be on abortionists and abortion profiteers. Profiteer A number one, Planned Parenthood, the biggest abortionist in the country. And also uh, as governor, what I can do, what I would do, what any pro-life governor would do is to uh, call things by their proper name. Call things by their proper name. Uh, as long as you have a word that ends in T-I-O-N, 
you're not being specific enough. Abortion is the deliberate dismembering of a preborn human being. Uh, and that should be said yeah. often in public. Peter side. Yep. Okay, thanks, Dr. Hanning. Um, California has a unique election system with your jungle primary. Um, how do you think that's working for California? Would you recommend it for other states? Uh, are there ways that you would reform it? Now, when you say jungle, you say, I guess, whoever gets the highest number of votes in the next and the next and the next, then they're going to go on. So you could have all Republicans uh, in an impossible world or all Democrats in the real world. Yeah. And does that benefit us? Uh, again, th there's got to be a, a background here. What we need to do in the state of California is to make it easier for third parties to get counted. And what we need to do is to move towards proportional representation, toward ranked choice voting. Uh, if they can do it in New York City, I don't know why we can't do it. Uh, we need to do those things. Those would uh, be major improvements in our election process. Great, thank you. Let, let's end with a, a fun one. Um, so I saw your recent Facebook post about Colexit, uh, the the far fetched, I guess, proposal to uh, for for California to secede from the union. Um, it's probably not going to happen. What are, what are the ways that the common good is served? You know, so the common good, uh, both for California and the United States, the whole, for the world as a whole, what are the ways that the common good is served by California remaining in the United States? Or are there also ways that either the people of California or the people of the United States as a whole would benefit from a separation? It's important to distinguish as you do. And speaking of the common good, we always want to say the common good for and fill in the blank. And at some point, we want to say the common good for the human enterprise. I think California contributes to the common good of the United States in terms of our digital creativity. I think it contributes to the common good of the United States by way of its extraordinary agricultural contributions. Uh, I think it uh, sometimes contributes to the common good of the United States by giving the United States something to look at and wonder about <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, ask itself, uh, is this where we're going? And uh, have we already learned lessons that we should unlearn? Uh, now, in terms of California itself, I think the first thing to say is given the political structures as they are, California would never be allowed to secede. It would not be allowed. But per impossibile, to use the first Latin expression of the evening, uh, were it to secede, uh, immediately there would be internal secessions. Uh, the counties closest to the eastern border, uh, because they are very different from the counties that are towards the west, they would very likely secede. And once the secessionist fever hit balkanization, uh, the Silicon Valley would secede. Uh, and in each of those cases, I think the problems uh, that California now faces would be faced by these smaller units within California. Uh, I am in favor of decentralization in principle, but it is a formal principle. It's a formal principle. And formal principles make sense only if they're uh, attached to substantive goods. I, I think we decentralize because it is a, a way to increase political activity. But if the political activity is the activity of, of bourgeois individualism or possessive individualism or expressive individualism or libertarianism, if that's the political activity, 
then that political activity will be on steroids and it's bad in the first place. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hannig. Uh, in this conversation, you've given us a lot of food for thought and also cause for action to, to get out there and uh, to, uh, to collect those signatures and, and tell our friends about the campaign. Um, anybody else who uh, wants an email, as, as Alan, Alan will receive an email from us, uh, feel free to just write your email there in the, in the chat. Uh, we'll be in touch with you. Uh, appreciate your donations, everyone. I appreciate your time. Um, and above all, Dr. Hannock, I appreciate uh, your time uh, being our keynote speaker at what is uh, our, our greatest convention uh, so far as a young party. So, should, so I thank translate, you. should I say, should I translate siempre adelante con juicio? You know, I, I thought about asking for, for a translation. You took French, actually, didn't you? You took I, French. Yeah, I'm trying to learn Spanish. Is that so. Spanish? All yeah, right. So, so that, comes from, that comes from a uh, father, now saint, Junipero Serra, uh, a terrible victim of, of cancel culture in its most grotesque forms. And what siempre adelante con juicio means is always forward with judgment. Mm. As in discernment. Balance. Yeah. The balance, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. And if anybody is on the East Coast, uh, I think you can still see Father Sarah in the rotunda, right? They haven't taken that down. I, I think I think he's his statue on behalf of California is there at the U.S. Capitol. So, well, great. Thanks so much, Dr. Hannick. Um, thank you, Kevin. Really look forward to following your campaign. And thank you so much for, for running on the American Solidarity Party ticket. Godspeed. Godspeed.